Thank you guys for coming in and talking to us. We really appreciate You're it. No problem. Um, congratulations on the new album, Suicide Pact. You first. Okay. Um, I have to ask, where did the title of this album come from? It's such an unusual title. Well, we were um, we were kind of thinking of titles for the album. We wanted something quite defiant and quite darkly comic, mm -hmm. and something which sort of summed up what we're about as people and what we've been through. And the album was kind of back to year zero for us. We've got a new worldwide deal and change record companies. And we've kind of left behind all our commercial stuff and we wanted to make more raw rock and mm -hmm. roll records again. I was reading a book at the time, one of my favorite English authors is a guy called Rupert Thompson. Mm -hmm. He's probably best known for a book he did on advertising called Soft, about the soft drinks companies. But he did a book called The Five Gates of Hell, which was um, a kind of play on teenage angst, things like West Side Story, everything like that. And the, the leader of the gang was famous for wearing a t-shirt with suicide packed on the front and you first on the back. Ah. And we just thought it summed up like the whole frame of mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's very clever. It's a, it's a very funny title, definitely. Now this album was marked a four year absence from you guys from the, yeah. from the American music yeah, scene right, anyways. Yeah. What, what was going on during that time with the band? Well, we had a lot of, um, <clears throat> up until like say 1995, we'd been very, um, we would release five albums mm -hmm. in, in Europe anyway, and we'd been doing a lot of touring. And um, just at the end of 1995, our old drummer decided that you know he'd, he'd had enough, didn't mm -hmm. like touring, so he left. And uh, we got Graham Hopkins, our new drummer, and Martin McCarrick. Uh, they joined as full-time members. So we basically did, you know, what you do when you, you know, you, you form a new unit. You know, got to know each other. We did um, quite a bit of touring in North America right. and Canada. And um, over the period of the year, we started, you know, just to to rehearse and learn how to, you know, play songs right, with the right. band, you know, make sure it was a good solid unit. And um, in 1998 in the United Kingdom we were, uh, and Europe we released an album called Semi Detached, mm -hmm. which which unfortunately wasn't released in in North America. And uh, two months after that album was released, NM Records in the United Kingdom and I believe in North America just disappeared. That was it. Right. There was a, a big sort of corporate buy over. So that was kind of, it was a weird time for us, but it was good in that you know, we'd, we'd fulfilled our contract with A&M, we'd, you know, we'd sort of part as friends, you know, and uh, we were able to wipe the slate clean, so it was back to year zero almost, right. you know, with the band. Right. So it was, um, it was good going out, getting our new deal, and, you know, going back to the garage and, and writing these songs, you know, just for ourselves, not right. because we right. knew we were going to have a record coming out next month, there was no set recording time or anything, and it was, uh, it was just really, really good, and a good way of, as we were saying earlier on, we were able to really put our fingers on what we liked about the band therapy right. and all the things and all the baggage that builds up over you know nearly 10 years we were able to get rid of and say well we don't want to do that we don't like this about the band <laughs> we don't we don't want to do that again but these are all the things we like and it, it was a really I think, a positive experience you know so um we haven't you know we haven't been sitting in big castles counting all our money or <laughs> anything that, like that, like, a, you know, losing the plot like, like rock stars are in. We've just been, you know, busy and it's, uh, you know, a variety of things happened and I think right. it, it worked out for the, much better for the health and the, the actual musical spirit of the band, so it was, it was a good thing. Was there ever a time when you thought therapy wasn't going to make it, that the band was going to disband? I think January 1999, because we'd... Um, We'd lost, NM had gone under and we'd finished our four album deal with them, but we still wanted to promote the album Semi Detached in mm -hmm. Europe. And we kind of paid for the, the crew and the tour bus and all our merchandise and manufacturing ourselves, myself and Michael. Um, so we'd done six months of that. The gigs were a success, they were sold out, it was going well. But uh, we were kind of thinking, you know, at the end of the year, well, we're kind of paying to work. <laughs> you know, it's like kind of a. Um, we should actually, after like being in this thing eight and a half years, be relaxing and not having to worry about right, that. But right. we were finding it was like really being back to the start again. So that was fun. We, we got through that and then it got to January and um, we'd, one, we said, right, we're going to go into the studio and we're going to just jam and we're going to get all our ideas and we're going to finish our album and we'll put it out in our own label. Because at the time we were in talks with companies about right. the new album. But we thought, well, we don't want to disappear for a year and a half, so we'll release a record in our own label. So January comes, no record label, considerably diminished in the bank balance account, and a drummer breaks his arm over yeah. Christmas, yeah. <laughs> so um, we were kind of, it got to about February, March 1999, we were in a small studio with a drum machine. Um, and I think at that point we were kind of, we were all beginning for the first time, we began to pick fights with each other and moan and bitch at, at everybody else. 
And then Graham, the drummer, came back. His arm was fine. He's drumming 20 times better than he ever had. Oh, wow. And after that, it was fine. But I think probably the beginning of 1999 was the nearest we've ever come in 10 years to calling it a day. Simply for the fact that we'd done everything we could with the best intentions and fate itself just went, it's not going to happen for you guys. <laughs> and uh, I think we were just this close. Whenever we got back, we got a new album, we got a new deal, we made a great record that we're proud of, and then that was fine. So it just means that we're totally re-energized now. That's excellent. Yeah. That's excellent. Which uh, actually I was going to ask you, but you basically touched on it that you have been together for over ten years yeah. about now, and yeah. th that kind of longevity is you know it's a big deal with with rock and roll bands. And yeah, I think so. You know, we we've this theory, <clears throat> one of our many sort of theories. You know, you look at bands, and you know, without sounding like you know old gets. It's like, you know, we've, we've seen them all come and go. We've seen the Manchester thing in the UK. We've seen the grunge thing. We've seen the new punk thing. We've seen the industrial thing. You know, there's there's all these different waves of things that, that, that come along. And, you know, these a lot of the bands last 18 months, make a, a debut album which sells a couple of million, then they disappear right. or disband or whatever. Right. And I think we, you know, the bands we like are people like Captain Beefheart, like REM, like you know, Depeche Mode, like Metallica, like Thin Lizzy, the mm -hmm. Black Sabbath, Motorhead, the, Motorhead, yeah. you right. know, Ramones. Yeah, they, they they have a history and there's there's a real Iggy it's, Pop. Yes, yeah, a big story. You know, they've you know one year they're really popular, right. one year it's they're the not. It's the CD stack theory we call it. It's where you go into a lot of people that we really love. Um, you go in and there's like twelve, maybe twenty sometimes CDs or, or records or cassettes of mm -hmm. that artist, and it's great fun because you can go like through Iggy Pop stuff who I love and go. Ooh, what was that about? <laughs> or, oh, well, this was great. Right. And it's something to talk about, same with Thin Lizzy. But what seemed to happen was kind of in the mid 90s, post grunge, there was a big boom of any guys with guitars getting signed to a major label. Mm -hmm. And obviously, they're signed for two albums. First one doesn't sell, second one doesn't even get released, they're dropped. And it's like, oh, well, that's the way it goes. But what we were talking earlier on today about no one considers themselves to be musicians anymore. With I mean, punk, I mean, because I was brought up in punk, and, and being a musician was a bad word, but I don't mean it in the technical side of it. I mean it in the side of what I do for a living, what I do to pay my rent, mm -hmm. to pay for my, my son to go to school, and to pay, to pay for my wife to have food in the house, is, is what I love doing. I'm a musician, and we write songs, we all create, right. and I'm proud to be that. It's like, but so many people now, there's a song in the album about have a 10 year plan that get to an indie, get three majors, become big. I'll become a producer, you go to Hollywood, 10 years down the line, I'll be getting an Oscar, you'll be getting a Grammy. And it, life doesn't work like that. But people, I know people in bands in the UK and in Ireland sit down with their 10-year plan and go, well, hold on, what about... The idea is you come home from work pissed one day, you want to get, get your guitar and you want to get your forte and you want to write about it. You can't do that. You can't start think, well, this is going to be big now. And there are people in the music business, like any other business in the world, that, and it's, it's seen in the media as being clever. Oh, that guy's clever. He can do this and he's so successful. It's not clever, it's, it's bullshit and as far as I'm concerned. I, don't know, I think there's always been a great deal of honesty mm -hmm. and dignity and self-respect in what therapy do. And we stand by that. I mean, we've seen it all come and go. You know, the amount of times in our 10 years when we were influenced by Sonic Youth and right. American, like sort of noise rock, Manchester came along, mm -hmm. goodbye therapy, it's all over. <laughs> that, that was good, wasn't it? That really took off. <laughs> so that was in grunge. And, People kind of sucked us into that because we're guitars and right, right, and Britpop. Yeah. You know, and then Britpop, when Britpop came, it was like we were told we might as well drive off a bridge because <laughs> that was it. You know, you wouldn't even be able to go to the states. I wouldn't be able to walk in here without everyone running around with Pulp, Oasis. Right, of she had seven T-shirts on. <laughs> Not going to happen. We were in the states, so what we did, we, we went to the states when Britpop was happening, and it was like Brit what? <laughs> <laughs> Brit what? <laughs> well, that's interesting though because I read, in, I read in. Uh, something about this new album that where you uh, said that this this was a conscious attempt to shake off the commercial side to your music yeah. that had sneaked in yeah. to your albums in the past what what drove you to that shift i think what happened was we, we deliberately made in 1994 after our, our kind of punk rock and roll roots we made an album called trouble gun which is all three and a half minute songs that, that i listened to as a kid it was very much ramonesy you know kind of power poppy stuff like mm -hmm. but, and it was all you know and it, to our total surprise, it went on to sell loads and loads and loads in Europe. So all of a sudden, a &M had seen us, a &M saw us as a token Nirvana signing. Right. We, we, signed, we did an album called Nurse, which is techno punk stuff, sold a wee bit. We had Trouble Gum that sold, like it's, it's now done something like a million in Europe. And that was then. So all of a sudden, we get another two album deal, and we, we've got full artistic control. 
So the kind of the thing that's Tom York from Radiohead said they have you by the balls though because then it's like our idea was we did this album at solos and we thought oh well it was a one off we'll make another noisy record next right, right. then all of a sudden you realise that when you get to town you're in the top hotel you're getting picked up in limousines you're getting given tickets to go and see films at premieres mm -hmm. and then it's like kind of and part of you being a working class kid from Belfast goes I kind of like this <laughs> so you get in to do your new album and you're kind of you're getting done you're doing this stoogy sonic youth riffarama noise fest and then you sort of think I want a new car, so you, put a, <laughs> so you put a chorus in it, and it, it, it kind of gets to you like that. And then well, I think that's what happened. We, we took it as far as we could up to Infernal Love, mm -hmm. and realistically, we should have stepped back and go right. We've done this now. We can't. We can't possibly the way we are as people. We can't take this any further. We're never going to be the size of Metallica. We've had a good time. Let's mm -hmm. buy out, take a year off the back. But we didn't. We were sucked in, so we made kind of two half-assed albums in, in Infernal Love and Semi Detached. And we, we didn't really realise, we couldn't put a finger on what it was we didn't like about the albums. And then whenever the whole thing happened with the deal and, and we did Suicide, but we thought, that's what it was, we weren't enjoying them. Right. Because one half of us was playing what we wanted to play and the other half of us had, you know, one eye on the new car, <laughs> which is bullshit. So we just thought, no way, that has to go. Wow. Um, the record has, you guys enlisted the, the work uh, or the help of produ uh, producer Head, yeah. mm -hmm. who's most notably known for his work with PJ Harvey. Yeah. How did you guys come together with him? Um, he actually, we were looking for a producer for the album. He phoned mm -hmm. our management because he, he wasn't doing anything and he heard they were looking for a producer. We thought, wow, you know, because <laughs> we sort of thought, you know, a tenor to be after all are kind of crossover in England and in Europe. Mm -hmm. A lot of people that are very serious about what they do kind of, you know, they're, they're kind of a sellout pop band, don't want right. to work with them. But he was really cool with us, and he, he came down to listen to the stuff, and he, we played him it in the rehearsal room, and he went, yeah, I'll do it. And the experience was, was what you expected with him? Totally, it was exactly, you know, what, what we needed for, mm -hmm. you know, to make the record, because he wasn't like, you know, he said, look, lads, you know, I know a lot of producers come in and put their stamp on it, and he said, basically, I record a band, but he says, that's my part of the deal, I'll make you sound really, really good, but your part of the deal is that, you know, I don't want any excuses. They're mm. your songs, you're the band. I'm not going to tell you what effect to put on something. Right. You know, he says, I'm going to do what you're doing, but it's your music, so you can't blame me. I'm just recording your ideas and what you have. And, and we thought, brilliant, because he mm. wasn't sitting there going, I'm not hearing it in the middle eight. Mm. You know what I mean? <laughs> Which a lot of producers do tend to do. They actually come in and try and, you know, tend to write the songs with you. And he said, look, you guys have got obviously got your own sound, got enough far too many ideas, you know, so let's get this down and let's just really work on getting a good performance from you. Yeah. And that was it. And he just teed us up. He was great, you know, yeah, and he, he wasn't like, he didn't sit and talk about, you know, who he'd worked with or, you know, where he didn't have a, a copy of like Billboard or Music Week <laughs> open, right. you know, seeing <laughs> stuff like this. And that, that was really good because it just takes that whole sort of pressure off you and you just concentrate on actually going in and playing and having fun and keeping right. an energy level to it, which is, what happens with us, we get bored very, very quickly. We have a very <laughs> short attention span, so we're in somewhere for a week and that's it, we're bored. You know, we want to do something else or change things. And he was saying, let's get in there and do it while you're excited, you know? How much does creative conflict uh, play a part when you guys are writing and recording? Are there, is, are there ever any moment, moments when you guys are button heads about where you want to take a song or? It's kind of got, you see, but with, with Trouble Going and Fern Love, I kind of did most of the writing. Mm -hmm. And that's where it all went wrong with Fern Love, because there was no input and we were a three piece. Mm. And me and the drummer, Fife at the time, weren't getting on. So he wouldn't say a thing. Right. Michael just didn't want to get involved, I think, at the time. And we sort of, it, 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 it was it basically got to the point where I didn't know what was doing and I was trying to call the shots. It was like blind leading the blind, really. Right. But um, we never had any arguments because everyone was like, let's just get this over with. But with uh, Suicide Pact, you first, it was like all four of us wrote it together and it was healthy. Mm -hmm. I think maybe in the next record it's going to be it's going to be a bit more tough but uh, in a good way because I think that friction is necessary because whenever we started the band we would spend weeks writing songs and arguing over arrangements right. mm -hmm. and then that kind of disappeared and although it's not nice at the time I do think you need that in the band. You need to sort of stand your ground and go I like this guitar riff and someone go it's rubbish <laughs> and then you have to fight over it until that, you get so, but it does help. It adds something. It also adds a lot, an awful lot. It makes you try harder. Right. Yeah. And there it are does. times when you're doing something, you're going, <laughs> right, okay. The other three guys, okay, they like this, so okay, I'll go along with it. And then you realise six more, and you go, oh, thank God, you know, they saved me from making yeah. a big mistake. <laughs> <in our record." laughs> so that that kind of 
uh, uh, exchange brings a different energy to the recording yeah, process. Yeah, I mean, the perfect thing is, see, at the end of the day, say you're writing, and you, at the end of the day, we're writing two songs, and we all sit down, we put on a cassette of it. Mm -hmm. the bit, the, there's no better feeling in the world than all four of us looking at each other and going, this is so cool, rather than, like, me coming in going, <laughs> and the rest of the band going, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so it's like kind of a, it's, there's, there's no better thing in the world than like actually because you do know right. we've been with especially me and Mike we've been with each other 10 years you, you, we can't bullshit each other anymore you right. know yeah, you, you know. know so it's like whenever the four of us sit again something sounds brilliant there's no better feeling than that yeah it's like, it's like people you meet people in bands and they're going oh I hate the rest of my bandmates they don't let me express myself freely and you know the, the, it could have been such a I had this great concept and those morons have ruined it and <laughs> I always think well go solo yeah. right? you know what I mean if I think being in a band is, is a lot of it is about compromise and, and getting on with it and you know putting a little bit of you into the big melting pot and I think you know if you know if you see being in a band is a hundred percent if if you're happy twenty five percent of the time brilliant you know that's right. all you can expect you know if you want to be ha happy hundred percent of the time go solo and show everyone what your fucking great idea right. was all band about are all the pieces put together exactly, exactly. Yeah. 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 and you yeah. know all the little ragged bits that stick out <laughs> and, and all the little all, disagreements oh, and many bands too whenever whenever you're in a band i look at it now you know it's, if you're in a band and all four members aren't happy say you're, you're playing a song that maybe say one of the band members hates playing mm -hmm. well if all four of us say we write an album we all love the album we play it when you're playing it that translates on stage because everyone knows i mean i know if we were playing a song that i really didn't want to play and all and you do see it with bands. Sometimes you go, the singer goes, and this is a ballad. <laughs> and there'll be the lead guitarist with the scary tattoos going. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it looks shit. I know it, looks, it looks really bad whenever the punters are watching it as well. And I think it's like, when everyone's all got one vision, it's like being in a gang. Right. Because even if, if the crowd don't applaud and they go, this is rubbish, you can be really defiant and go, well, we fucking love it. You're missing out on it then. And you have that. Whereas if two or three people in the band aren't really getting it themselves either, that's what causes problems because then you start thinking, well, maybe maybe this isn't good. Mm -hmm. So you need that kind of like unity there, right? Of course, of course. Um, is this the first time you guys have played South by Southwest, or have you been here before? We've been in Austin before, but mm -hmm. we've never played this particular festival thing. Is uh, have you played yet? Have you played um, this time around yet? No, or no, we're playing tonight. Season? Tonight, 11 tonight. Talk, yeah. Do you think it'll be different playing in front of an audience that's filled with industry people? as opposed to fans that come to see the band? It might be. We decided that we arrived here last night and we just all, four of us sat in the hotel lobby and said, look, we're getting exposure from this. Mm -hmm. We've got a, f a trip over to Texas. We, we've just spent six months in Europe, in Budapest and in Prague, places where it's really cold this time <laughs> of year. And we've, we've played like great shows and we've been playing for two hours, you know, playing an hour and a half, two hours a night. I think they, they want us to play 40 minutes. We've come, we've come over. We're going to get to see some more bands tomorrow night and right. hang out. It's beautiful weather. We think if it's industry, you know, if there's if there's ten people there, if it's three fifty, if there's three, four hundred people there that are all industry, it doesn't matter. We're here. Our names are in all the sheets. Our names will be on all the websites. There'll be people here that know of us. If it, a friend of mine rang me today that lives in LA, mm -hmm. that is here and he's coming down to see us, and he's not industry and things like that. So I mean, if, the way we look at it, it's just actually getting here and playing. Right. It's good. And we'll enjoy it, you know, I mean, it doesn't really matter. You can't go on stage, and there's no point in us going on stage and going, yeah, fuck the business, you know, <laughs> you're all a part of cunts, yeah. You know, fuck that. You know, we're just, we've, got, we've got 40 minutes, and we're going to play high energy rock and roll for 40 minutes and have the time of our lives. Excellent. And make of it what you will. Excellent. Yeah. What do you think is the most offensive thing about pop music today? People in pop music not realizing what it is and taking it seriously. <laughs> what I don't, you know, so I, don't, I don't mind if someone's in pop business and you've got a 50 year old guy writing pop tunes and there's someone dancing and they go, oh, we need a face for this song to do it. Fine, it's harmless. Mm -hmm. It will always be there. The songs will get played on the radio, they'll be catchy. But what I don't know is like is when you get like an 18 year old kid that joins a band as a dancer and he can't sing and he can't play, but he's being told he's great. And he, in his mind, he's a musician. Right. He, I mean, I, I, do, I, I admire people that are in pop that are talented. You got people like Prince and all that is great. But it's when you get the kind of mannequins in. If the mannequin is in going, I'm in this, I'm 18 years of age, I'm horny, I'm getting paid loads of money, I've got all the drink I want, I've got girls knocking the door, great. But it's when you get the kid that's like 18 mm -hmm. and thinks this is his first step to becoming Elton John, that's when I, I don't like that and that people right. encourage it. But I don't like seeing it when people take it seriously. Right. I think pop music, it's populist music should be done with a great joy of life. And if you're going to go down that route of playing to people in shopping malls and enjoying yourself, great and enjoy it. 
but it's when people start actually thinking that they're changing the world with, with the name pop music that it's dangerous. Not not for Johnny Passerby because pop music will never die, right. but for the people themselves. I, I'm sure that messes up with their head. You totally, know? yeah. Especially when they're flipping burgers when they're 25. <laughs> you know, right. Michael, do you agree with all that? Oh, totally. I. It's just. It's, it's, but I, I don't know what it's like, you know, in in North America. But in the UK, there's like a steady stream of like, you know, smiley happy faces, <laughs> you know, and then six months later, and I wonder where they go. Is there like methadone <laughs> clinic? <laughs> That's probably right. That's probably very right. You know, rewinding, rewinding three and a half minutes of their fame on a Saturday morning kids TV show. <laughs> look at this bit here. <laughs> Look at my 360 movement. <laughs> uh, so what's next for therapy after after South by Southwest? We have four weeks off, nice. uh, which is like we've just done a six month tour, but we are trying to, to get, we definitely want to come over here for at least two months, mm -hmm. at least, before the end of the year. We have like loads of festivals coming up in Europe, mm -hmm. uh, Europe, Ireland and England, stuff like that. And we have another European tour lined up for later in the year, but what we really want to do is come over and, and try and get a fan base on the go. I mean, the last time we came over in 96, mm -hmm. whenever we came over in 94 with Trouble it was Blaze of Glory, NM, Flyers Everywhere, Hype, all industry gigs. And you know, the kids are going, well, who are these guys? <laughs> we came back in 96, we're, and we were playing to like 50 to maybe 150, 200 people a night in clubs. And kids at all the records bought an import. And they're going, why don't you ever come play? And we wanted like at least two months, come over here and play our own shows if we can, or get on to a really good festival or something. But, like, spend a bit of time here because there, we get loads of, there's a website in America, there's kids email us and all like that and they buy all our records and import and they've been doing so for the last three albums and we'd like to kind of come over and play for the people that love the band and, and do it the old fashioned way, you know, not come in right. the back of a, a big magazine cover <laughs> or push, you know, we're too old for that now as well. <laughs>